Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to Fullerton Hall. I'm Fawn Ring, and I'm the Director of Lectures and Performance Programs here at the Art Institute of Chicago. We're very happy to have you here this evening. Uh, as you may know, some of you probably signed up for this program back in January. And unfortunately, um, we were, it was a victim of the polar vortex. So, but tonight, curator Jonathan Tavares and armorer Jeff Wasson are indeed with us. The show must go on. Jonathan is going to begin our program this evening with a talk about the Saints and Heroes galleries. And then Jeff is going to join him for a conversation about the work that they've done together and also just about the life of an armorer. Before we get started, please, will you turn off your phones so that we don't have any bleeps in the middle of this? Um, also, this program is presented with the American Sign Language Interpretation and Mobile Communication Access Real-Time Translation, or CART. And I want to give a special thanks to our ASL translator, Amy Kistner, and also to Kathy Raycan, who is the CART captioner for us this evening. By the way, if you want to access the captions on your phone, you can go to arctic.edu backslash captions. Very easy. I'm going to introduce Jonathan now, and he is the Art Institute's Associate Curator for Arms and Armor and European Decorative Arts before 1700. He was instrumental in the planning and creation of the Armor Gallery. Jonathan has studied historical arms and armor at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. He's taught courses on fashion and armor at the Rhode Island School of Design and the Fashion Institute of Technology in New York. He's lectured to academic groups all over, including the American Society of Arms and Armor Collectors and the Arms and Armor Club of Manhattan. Please welcome Jonathan Tavares. Thanks so much, Fawn. It's so good to be here and for it not to be as freezing cold as it was as the last time I was to speak to you on this subject. Um, but it's such a joy to talk to you about this subject. Um, so, um, just over four years ago, uh, in the fall of 2015, while considering the collection of arms and armor for this redisplay, uh, it, I was compelled to learn more about a question that has uh, fascinated me and also haunted me since childhood. Uh, what did it take to make Renaissance plate armor from beginning to end? And um, I found that many visitors ask the same question uh, to me in just pondering the objects in the cases. Uh, and I wondered in preparation for the new galleries, how could we learn more? Uh, and most especially, how could we give visitors a way into this fascinating uh, inquiry? Um, where, where, where could we bring the pieces to life in a way uh, that is not how you experience them in the case static? Uh, a lot of uh, arms and armor uh, is, uh, is very dynamic, but when you go to a museum, it's, it's not experienced, unfortunately, that way. So we have to do new things. Uh, different concepts have to come out uh, to get people the full experience of it. So one of those, of course, is uh, cart demonstrations that I do on occasion, uh, every so many months, maybe, uh, and especially for classes. And here you're seeing actually a student from a class who fit this armor from around 1610 quite well, actually. Um, they didn't know what they were getting into, um, but I did, of course. And so there's our cart. And this is a technique that has been around for decades, and various museums have used this uh, growing up uh, not far from Massachusetts as a child, the Higgins Armory Museum used to do this kind of work, and I always wanted to be the one picked. I was never picked. Uh, I changed things, however. I changed fate. Um, the other way around, uh, too, is by having these touch pads in the galleries that you're seeing here, where families can come gather and they can learn and they can get an in-depth understanding uh, of uh, exactly what I'm talking about. How are these things made? How are they move? All of that. And actually, that's where... Uh, this idea sort of almost begun. Uh, that is to recreate one of our armors uh, and to have clips, video clips, that showed 
uh, how that process might unfold so that visitors could come look at the armor and get that window into this deeper understanding, uh, as it were. And you know, we have the technology now, and that's really helpful. Uh, but if I'm going to be really truly honest, it all started with this. Uh, this is my science fair project. Uh, when I was in eighth grade, uh, if you can believe that, uh, it was perhaps not as successful as I would have liked. It's made out of galvanized sheet metal. I did not use any heat in this process. Uh, but from this moment, uh, I was compelled to think more and more as I looked at armor, how did they get that shape? How did they get that form? And it's always been in the back of my head, and I wanted to experience that for myself, and I wanted others to experience it as well. Uh, so what did we do? Uh, we put together a sort of armor-making dream team. This sort of idea came to me. Um, and so uh, we got a team of blacksmiths, in armor, Jeff Wasson, uh, chemical historians to reproduce the etching recipes from the period for the acid, uh, and, and printmakers uh, and uh, uh, painters, a gilder, um, uh, filmmakers, and most especially uh, uh, two very generous donors, um, Richard Gradkowski, and uh, one of which is also in the audience, uh, Mr. Daniel Manugian, and I'm very grateful for them uh, for helping this process to unfold and also to get involved, which was really exciting. Uh, so it takes many hands to put together an armor today, and it took many hands to put together an armor in the period uh, by far. Um, and so the next stage was to find uh, the character, as it were, what was going to be the armor that we were reproducing. And I kept coming back to this one. This is truly an amazing masterpiece in our collection. It's, uh, these are portions of a field armor that is an armor for the battlefield uh, made in the royal workshops of Greenwich in England around 1588 or possibly as late as 1589. Uh, it is in many ways the peak of armor making. Um, before it starts to decline and become victim uh, to the uh, to guns uh, and new forms of armaments that basically made armor over a slow process uh, go into decline. So uh, just to give you a little background, uh, so in the 16th century when this armor was made, and this is an image uh, from uh, the earlier part of the 16th century, uh, you can see here fully armored men on horseback were actually facing guns. Uh, for our mindset in what Hollywood portrays, this seems to be at odds for us. We don't think of the fully armored individual, the knight in shining armor, being in the same place in the same time as guns. But for the fact of the matter is they were, for a couple of hundred years in fact. Guns uh, began uh, in Western Europe sometime around 1300. Uh, and they gradually uh, perfected to the point where you get to here in the 16th century, where they're making quite a major presence on the battlefield. And uh, by the time of the Greenwich armor, it absolutely was the, the major weapon of the battlefield. And then you get uh, major clients uh, like uh, this uh, nobleman that you're seeing in this miniature portrait that's in the Queen's collection. This is William Compton, the first Earl of Northampton. He is likely the original owner of our armor. Uh, we have some evidence, uh, mainly, most especially, this portrait itself. Uh, there are a few other armors with this same pattern on it, uh, but this one is uh, seemingly this same armor uh, because there's, uh, as I'm just going to show you, another piece of evidence as well. But Compton uh, was a nobleman during the reign of Queen Elizabeth I. He had to get a license from the queen. Uh, he had to apply to have this armor made by her royal workshop. It was a really big deal. It was about as expensive of an armor as you could have had, uh, maybe uh, several times the yearly salary of a skilled laborer in this period. But what was Compton thinking about? What was going on at this time? Well, that was this. Uh, Compton was probably going to be a commander uh, for the land forces, that's all these guys over here, if the Spanish Armada in 1588 was successful, uh, broke through the English barrier and actually allowed mass quantities of Spanish soldiers to invade England. Uh, Philip II of Spain uh, wanted to take England for his own. He thought that he had the right to do so, uh, and for various reasons I can get into. But um, the point is, is uh, Elizabeth had to rally forces, and you know, when you have a big flotilla like this, it's not really that much of a state secret after a while. Um, 
they knew they were coming and they were preparing, and so the great nobility uh, were in fact ordering armors uh, from uh, the royal workshops to prepare. And that's what this is. That's what our armor is. Uh, this is a two-page spread um, from a uh, essentially a album by the head armorer, Jacob Halder, uh, depicting his clients, this is my Lord Compton and the armor as it was complete. And of course, we're missing today the helmet, the gauntlets, the upper uh, leg portions uh, called quiches. Uh, but one of the fun things is, is it also shows you other parts, uh, like this reinforcing breastplate called the placard that fits over the uh, other breastplate to make it bulletproof. And uh, it's also designed to match. Uh, was armor bulletproof? Uh, well, maybe it wasn't canon proof, as you can see here. Um, so uh, this is a contemporary breastplate, either English or Flemish, uh, from about 1590. Uh, it, this is not done while someone was in the field. The thought is, is this was a test uh, to show what would happen. So you see multiple bullet uh, holes from muskets. This one went through. This one, obviously, <laughs> they took a small cannon, and they shot at it, and came out the other end. Um, but a lot of armors you'll see in the gallery have these little marks like this. These are called proof marks. Uh, and these were done by the armorer to prove to the client that the armor could resist uh, a bullet. Now, there's a lot of conjecture uh, in the field as to whether they under uh, packed the powder uh, in the in the pistols or uh, the muskets and sort of just made a dent uh, and then let them on their way. There's been a lot of uh, ink spilled to try to say one way or the other. Uh, so that was one of our questions as well. And when Nova, PBS Nova, got involved to make their documentary following our project, they made it possible to actually test the theory, and we'll have more on that soon. Uh, but the first thing I wanted to talk to you, while we were starting this project and we put together the team of blacksmiths to make the plate, uh, we had to construct furnaces in a way that really hadn't been done before. And truly, truly, museums, other aspects, um, other institutions haven't done this kind of an experiment before uh, in living memory. So we had to reconstruct the concepts uh, of furnaces using books like De Re Metallica, published in 1556, uh, to understand the smelting process, the bloomery steel. This is where, for in this case, 14 hours, uh, we put charcoal into this furnace, used bellows to heat it, uh, and iron ore. Uh, it took 200 pounds of iron ore to make a 30-pound armor. That's how inefficient it was in this period. So when you go into the galleries and you see these armors, you understand how much natural resources are involved here. And this is why armor making centers were located near to the raw materials, especially charcoal and forests and all of that. This was all very important. Um, and here's just a clip uh, that you'll find in the galleries in that touch uh, pad of our team using the bellows and smelting uh, the iron ore. And here they're pulling out the bloomery. So it's capillary action. Um, uh, the iron uh, comes together with the carbon that's in the charcoal, and it's making this spongy mass uh, called a bloom. And they're compacting it here, and you've seen the, the uh, slag is rolling out of it. And then the next stage is to take that spongy mass and to make it into a plate. And to do that, they fold it and they forge weld it onto itself. They put it back into the furnace, heat it up, and pull it out and hammer it into a plate. So naturally, the plates of the armor have these laminations, sort of like cardboard, that give it strength, but also try to make it a little bit more homogenous and drive off the impurities. And that has an effect. So this is uh, the plate that was going to become the breastplate. And you can see here the process of drawing out the mass from the center. And this is a drawing by our armor, Jeff Wasson, to instruct the smelters, uh, the blacksmiths, on how the plate needed to be made. And with that, I have the extreme pleasure to introduce one of the world's leading reproduction uh, armorers, Jeff Wasson. Please come to the stage. <laughs> Jeff, so good to have you here today. Um, and it was fun to pick your brains earlier today as well in storage and all this other good fun we had. But um, so Jeff, uh, 
You have a really unusual job uh, for this day and age. Uh, not too many people are full-time armorers. There's a lot of hobbyists out there. Um, and I, so I want to ask you, uh, what was your path to this unique uh, profession? So much like you, Jonathan, um, I got interested in arms and armor when I was a child. And uh, actually, I got my hands on a car hood <laughs> and I cut it apart, and I hammered that into armor. And I thought I was just all by myself doing this. Actually, it was in, in high school when I started uh, my, you know, realized that I could, I could make things out of metal and, and make armor. And, and uh, so uh, it was in high school. And uh, so, but then when I went to college, uh, then I learned that there were other people that were actually in clubs or groups uh, the Society for Creative Anachronism, <laughs> I got involved with them, and there are people that are interested in the Middle Ages, and they, as a hobby, they go and fight <laughs> in armor. So they wear the armor that they are, uh, you know, and they go out and fight and hit each other with clubs. Uh, and it's, it's a lot of fun, and uh, it's, uh, you know, it was a great, uh, I was in college at this time, well, this, uh, there's another image of, uh, they have huge battles, so uh, where they have these uh, clubs, it's very martial, uh, and they do other things besides fighting. I mean, they, they promote, you know, medieval and historical studies, you know, whatever you're interested in, but as a hobby, and uh, so it was a great place to, uh, to meet other people that were interested mm -hmm. in armor, and it really helped me out. Uh, I met other guys that made armor, and we all formed a little group, and we started making armor together. And, but supplying uh, uh, people in the SCA. They've been excellent clients uh, continuously. They have, yeah, yep, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, uh, When would you say, how did things change for you though? There's a point where you got very, very serious. Uh, things sort of moved in the direction to become full-time armorer. So there was a couple of, of points where that happened. One of them was uh, when I realized um, that uh, armor could be made uh, using steel that can be hardened and tempered. Mm -hmm. So, and that adds a whole other dimension to the and process. And we'll talk more about that, of course, yep. and what that process yep. is. But and, uh, and at that time, I, I met another armorer. His name is Robert McPherson, uh, who's very famous and well-known. And... Uh, uh, you know, he's very much into historical accuracy and he's really good. And so it was really wonderful for me to work with him and, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, get that guidance or mentorship. So also when uh, I also uh, moved away from just like foot combat and got into horse uh, uh, combat. How did and, that happen? Uh, jousting. <laughs> So that happened by uh, uh, one of the medieval groups that we were part of in the New York area. They had horses, and uh, uh, they were having trouble with their current jousters. I guess the jousters didn't have enough experience. And who was responsible and, for pulling you into this? And uh, my wife, actually. <laughs> uh, so my wife is also, was also in the SCA, had armor, and she also, as a, uh, as a girl growing up, she had a lot of horse riding experience. Uh, mm -hmm. So the, the person that was running the whole jousting thing said, oh, we, uh, you know, mm -hmm. they tricked her into coming. <laughs> and uh, actually, I was her squire in the beginning. And, uh, but anyway, it worked out really well because she had the horse riding mm -hmm. aspect of it and the training with horses, and then I was the armorer. So then it became really apparent that when you're jousting that you really need the glancing surfaces, that the visors and the breastplates, you know, the armorer, you need that in order to survive against, you know, a lance coming down and at you. Uh, you have to have those glancing surfaces. So uh, that was really added a whole other dimension and, and really took me to another level. And now everything came together because the, the, the hardened and tempered steel was very important uh, yeah. for making proper armor. Um, the other thing that happened too was that I, uh, I made connections with the Metropolitan Museum of yes, Art. Yes, we met each other first time. Yes. Uh, you came into the museum um, and you were studying pieces in the library there. I was uh, an assistant in the department and uh, we were looking at pieces together. I was really fascinated to say to you, what do these hammer marks mean? What's this, what's that? And, and you were looking at the details of how things fit together and, and what was it like to handle originals. What did that do for you as an armorer? You know, it was very inspiring and it really takes on a whole nother dimension. You know, uh, in the beginning, you know, you look at pictures in books and uh, you look at other pictures, you can go to the museum and look in their galleries and see objects. 
but to actually handle an object and feel how heavy it is and you know, see maybe how the plates interact and also to look on the inside and see the hammer marks. I mean, it, uh, it takes you to a whole nother level. Uh, it was just, it was very helpful. And, and Jeff, you truly are at another level. These are two of his great masterworks. Uh, the uh, armor here, uh, actually, I had the fun job of uh, putting you on to. Uh, we have, the, the Metropolitan Museum has the model for this piece, and we looked at that together, and you copied it beautifully. Yes, we did, yep. Uh, we also have a, another one of these, actually, in this collection, in the Art Institute, in one of the uh, trophies or panoplies up in the top in the, in the display, which is great. Uh, but I remember, you know, looking, pouring over that piece, and you just get the line so beautifully. And then we have this, uh, truly, I think it is your masterpiece, uh, stunning, made for this client. Um, uh, it is uh, modeled after an armor that is split in half, sort of. The, the upper section is in the Wallace Collection in London, and the legs are in the Royal Armories uh, in Leeds, uh, in England. Uh, but truly, Jeff, when I look at your work as a curator, uh, and I see the beauty of how you make these compound curves, this sweeping line of the leg. That's a telltale sign of a perfect eye, in a way. Uh, very impressive. And that, I have to say, not just because I met you, but that's what drew me to you uh, for this project. Um, I, how do you feel about this work? Uh, uh, <laughs> I, yeah, I think you're right. I mean, it was, is, this armor is one of the, the, um, one of the best works that I've done. Uh, and um, like you were saying before, uh, you know, the way that the, the leg is sculpted and how well it fits, uh, it, it, it takes just years of experience of doing it over and over again to get it right. And, and you make um, models of your clients' legs. I do, you? I do. I make leg, I do leg castings. So if somebody is interested in commissioning an armor, I have to cast their legs and then I have a model that I can use to get the shape just right. And they did this in the curves. period as well. Uh, we know from some inventories of certain armors, uh, particularly those who uh, patron Charles V, that they had wax legs of his, uh, his um, excellency or whatever yep. uh, in their inventory. So this was something that was done. Um, uh, it's pretty impressive, Jeff. Um, and this is what you call your workshop, I believe. Uh, Yep. which um, uh, you can't see it that well, but there's an amazing view of the Manhattan skyline uh, through these windows. Uh, but Jeff, um, uh, is it getting harder to be an armorer? Uh, what's it like? I mean, do, do people appreciate your craft? <laughs> what's, what's the business of armoring? Well, uh, I've found uh, that it's not just about being an artist uh, or being a craftsman, that you also have to be a businessman, that you also have to have social skills, you have to mm. interact with people, um, get back to people. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's hard, it's not, it's not easy. And here's the other thing, I mean, in the past, uh, uh, you know, there was a much uh, bigger demand for armor uh, to outfit armies and uh, noblemen, and there were whole workshops of people that were mm. uh, making these things. And, uh, consisting of masters and journeymen and apprentices. So there's a whole structure there. You have one assistant, I understand. I have one assistant, yeah, and he only works part-time. Over there. Yeah. Oh, there he is, yeah. Uh, so it's, it's a little bit different today because uh, I'm trying to recreate something that is, it's not in the same scale as it was in the past. Uh, and also as a modern armor, a lot of times people come to me uh, somebody wants 14th century armor, and then somebody wants 16th century armor, and somebody wants an English style, and somebody wants a German style. So it can, um, you know, I'm expected bit. to know a lot more than, <clears throat> than what somebody in the past would know. How many armors are in the queue right now? Uh, <laughs> three or four, maybe. And I have a bunch of parts and pieces, and uh, actually I stopped taking armor orders just so I could get caught up because I am, I'm behind, and mm -hmm. uh, I need to get caught up. So what did you think when I came to you with this crazy idea? Like, did you say this curator's nuts um, when I said, <laughs> can you make it an armor? Can you copy this armor? But you need to use bloomery steel. Well, I think as a, a craftsman, you know, in my journey of trying to recreate the craft and trying to make armor, you're very much interested in the historical accuracy of things and you want to get right at like, well, how did they do it and am I being as accurate as they were? And you know, the hammers and the anvils and the stakes are all very important, but uh, 
you know, that, that's kind of a dream is to, I think it's a dream in other crafts too, to get as close as you can to, if you're recreating something from the past, you know, how were they doing it? So, mm -hmm. uh, so in the beginning, yeah, it was very exciting, like, okay, this could be really cool and, you know, really interesting, something I've always wanted to do. Uh, but then realizing when it really started to happen, like, wait a minute, uh-oh, this is really happening. This is gonna be a lot of work. Uh, <laughs> And then add to that a film crew, and then there's some real pressure. Oh, yeah. And then documentary yeah. deadlines, which we didn't even anticipate in the beginning. Right. Uh, when Nova right. got involved, the PBS Nova. But <clears throat> so what did you anticipate as some of the major difficulties that you were going to have to succumb with this material, with this bloomery steel? Um, so that was kind of an unknown, because uh, uh, Rick Fira was going to make the metal and uh, from Bloomery Steel, mm -hmm. and I didn't know how hard it was going to be. You know, maybe it would be brittle, maybe it would be, uh, maybe it would be really tough to work. Uh, so that was really an unknown. <coughs> didn't know uh, what to expect there, and I knew that I would have to work it differently because I knew that the metal was much thicker on the breastplate, and uh, and I knew that I couldn't just. It wouldn't be like modern sheet metal. Mm -hmm. um, so that was really a big unknown. So uh, like this is one of the plates that you were going to be handed, uh, was one of the earlier trial runs. One of the test pieces. Uh, yeah. So one of the things that you saw is that billets of steel are folded. And that manifests on the actual pieces. You can actually see here in the corner of this arm opening, there is a fissure, a crack that runs through there. And uh, usually we, we always see these on original pieces. There's always gonna be a, what we call a delamination somewhere. It's a telltale sign of the product. Uh, then we look at the, uh, the plate, we can see the delamination all over the place. Uh, so when you saw this plate come right out of the forge, because you were there with me, yep. I'm holding it here. Yep. What was running through your mind? Maybe this isn't going to work. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't know. It, it was definitely, you know, first off, to watch the material be, be pushed, you know, to start with a blank and then be hammered into, into a, a flat plate like that. I mean, it's, it's an intriguing material. Uh, here are these photos. We can see can pictures of what's going on. Uh, and you can Other see. Uh, turn around. The, uh, there you go. Okay, there we go. <laughs> you can see how it's delaminating right there, right? Uh, and then also, over here, when you heat up a plate <clears throat> and it gets red hot, the, the areas that are very thin will cool down very quickly. So right now we can see areas where uh, the plate, once it was forge welded together, have now uh, cooled down and, and are revealing an area mm -hmm. that's, you know, it's not stuck completely mm -hmm. together. So, uh, so that introduced some you know, interesting problems that had to de be dealt with. And ordinarily, so let's talk about some armoring techniques. So uh, a modern technique, uh, well, it's also an ancient technique, is raising, where you have a stake and you hold the metal and uh, you hammer just off the edge and you push it down so that it, it's, you push it down around the, uh, the form of the stake. And that's raising. And another technique that we use sometimes is dishing or sinking where you're hammering into a hollow, mm -hmm. all right? And these two techniques are used in conjunction to uh, form the metal. A lot, a lot of times they're used by coppersmiths and silversmiths, but there's also a technique, and uh, you do this also after these techniques sometimes, it's called planishing. However, the, I'm doing something a little bit different, and this has been talked about in the arms and armor community. Uh, you know, how are plates you know, because when you look at armor on the inside, you see that they're very rough. There's these uh, heavy, intense hammer marks. So what are those hammer marks from? And so it seems to be that there's this technique that we've called squashing. And uh, basically, you heat up. The plate has to be red hot. And you're forging it. You're compressing the metal. And what happens is, is the metal squeezes out. And it, can only, it can't go into the anvil, so it goes to each side. And that creates volume. Uh, and that also gives you this lumpy, cratered surface on the inside. But if your anvil is very smooth, then you get a very smooth outside surface, which is exactly what you want on a piece of armor. So on this piece here, now you can see how lumpy 
and uh, irregular the inside surface of the armor is. So this is the inside of our breastplate, the actual piece that's in, on view now that Jeff was copying. So another interesting thing that you see is these lines here. And uh, those are marks from a tool that's used to put in the embossing. And we'll talk about that later. Um, you also can see these uh, roped edges. The, the roping is, or the, uh, the roll is turned to the inside. And how did you uh, prepare for this task? So we did a lot of, uh, so I came here to the museum and we, um, we looked at the armor. We, uh, I made drawings and measurements. Uh, I had a special caliper that I could measure the thickness of the metal, so I used, mm -hmm. I used that. Uh, and I just tried to collect as much information as I could, uh, all different ways, so that I would have you know, plenty of stuff to refer to. I took a lot of pictures. But actually, I find that, the, that drawings are a more important tool for understanding the, the actual shape and form mm -hmm. of the armor. Mm -hmm. So another thing that I did uh, was um, I went and visited Mac, or Robert McPherson, uh, who I talked about earlier. And uh, he does stuff with pewter. And uh, so he gave me these disks. And pewter is very soft. And so what I did as sort of a proof of concept was take a hammer and just hammer out a little miniature breastplate starting with this slug of pewter as my starting blank. And that, that uh, proved it's, it's that proof this squashing concept. technique yeah. worked. Yeah, on a flat surface. On the flat, yeah, yeah. This little breastplate was made you know, just on the flat of the anvil and off, also off the edge to form the flange. How and, long did uh, that take you, Jeff? Uh, maybe about an hour. Oh, wow. But That's you got to remember, this is pewter, and it's very tiny. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the, if you were to scale up the size of the hammers, you would, you would see that, you know, it'd be like using power hammers, huge power hammers. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing here now your drawings, right, of the direction uh, of where the metal is going. Right. So, so number, you know, in, in the number one there, you have to sort of thin, prepare the blank by thinning out the metal, uh, stretching it to the edges. Uh, to the sides. Number two, more of that same stretching. So then at number three, then when you're hammering there, you're starting to curl the metal around and form the, the volume of the breastplate. And it's really thickness uh, is really an important aspect. So uh, when Jeff came to visit me uh, the first time to look at and examine the armor, <clears throat> you took your calipers and you did a, a topography of the entire breastplate. This is something using rolled steel as you usually use, you don't deal with as much because it's all uniform thickness. Yes. That's the beauty of these actual pieces, these yeah, period if you, pieces. Yeah, if you think about modern steel, it's rolled out in a perfectly consistent sheet that's all the same thickness all throughout. It's all the same alloy. And this is completely different. This is, this is the plate that we got. And we intentionally had um, the Smiths hammer in a way so that it would be very thick in the center. And mm -hmm. then as you got towards the edges, it would thin out. And because uh, I was, when I got through hammering it, I would thin it down and I would stretch the material or compress it. And so, Jeff, um, if I understand correctly, you've never had to do these techniques as much before. You've never. I, I was aware, uh -huh. or I'd done like small test plates, but to tackle a Greenwich breastplate is a tall order. Uh, yeah, it's... to have this, this. And if I remember correctly, you're probably, what, about five ounces off of the original? Yeah, the, the weight of my breastplate actually matches the weight of the, uh, That's the real pretty thing incredible. very closely. It's just uh, off by some, a couple ounces. And I think we can attribute that to this meticulous record keeping of thickness and yes. where you're going, what direction it's going. Uh, so, yeah, so, you know, take me through the process. Um, take us all through the process. Well, what, what do we, how do we begin this making of this breastplate? We, you, they've given you a plate. Where do you go from there? You've got templates. And... So the first step is uh, drawing out the edges and then also trimming off the excess material. Uh, and so you can see like chalk lines on the, uh, on the plate there where I'm going to trim them away. And I'm using a chisel to do that. And it was done hot. I would hot cut it. Uh, and then on the right-hand side there, you have a drawing of the breastplate. And 
you have my uh, trimmed blank, and we're ready to start uh, adding volume to the piece by hammering it in. So in this, in this image, you can see uh, the breastplate's been heated up in the center there. Uh, I have a sledgehammer, and, and I'm just hammering on it, and it's all done on the flat of the anvil. So uh, actually, one of the things I learned from this is uh, I could have used a bigger anvil. <laughs> uh, we were right on the edge of making this work. You know? And what's really fascinating for me in, in learning all of this and the revelations that are coming through this, the epiphanies, if you will, um, when we look at period illustrations from the time, that's what we see here. We see a, a somewhat flat anvil, and uh, here a master armor perhaps with the tongs instructing the two with his hammer where to hit. Um, and you've got two strikers uh, with the sledgehammers moving the form. Of course, it's worked hot and it's worked on a flat surface uh, This in a much bigger anvil. <laughs> um, but uh, funny, we actually have much bigger anvils in storage here. But anyway. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Lucky you. Uh, well. They're, not, they're out of commission these days. Yeah. But uh, in here we have a clip uh, that you can see in the galleries of uh, Jeff working the piece, squashing it, uh, to use your term. <laughs> now, Jeff, we're seeing a lot of flakes coming off here. Tell me about that. What is that? So what's happening there is that when, whenever you heat up the metal uh, and it becomes soft like that, it also becomes more reactive. Uh, with the oxygen in the air. So it's a chemical reaction where the, uh, it's oxidation, almost like rusting, uh, and, uh, and those pieces are flaking off. And that's actually something that you have to take into account whenever you're making, forging something, that you're gonna lose a percentage of the material depending on how much forging you decide to do. Mm -hmm. And so you wanna have as much mass. There's an end goal here. It has yeah. to stop a bullet. So you want to make sure you're not losing too much with too many extra heatings of yes. the steel. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, the good thing about this, this style is it is a thick, thick plate. Yeah, you had a lot to work to with. Thick. Uh, you know, I wasn't worried about losing too, too much material. Uh, and also I was being very cautious and conservative in, in how I went about the process. I was not like, mm -hmm. you know, rushing to get this done or anything. And it just so happened you were creating another Greenwich armor out of rolled steel. I did, For yeah. a different client at the same time. So we had this ability to put this lineup of the progression of a Greenwich uh, piece cod belly. Piece cod belly meaning referring to the shape of this pea pod shape. So that, so that was, was another thing. Behind. So we have the piece cod breastplate, then we have the placard that goes over this. Yep, right uh, on the side of you. And then we have, yep, the placard right here. Then we have uh, another placard and then another uh, breastplate in a more finished state. But this, this lineup kind of illustrates that everything doesn't happen all at once, it happens in stages. So, you know, first you're doing the light shaping and the trimming, and then, the, you know, you start to get closer to what looks like uh, a breastplate, and then you curl it around even further. And now you're starting to define the piece cod shape. And uh, at the end there, then you start the grinding and sanding because you have a finished, uh, an almost finished piece. I can see the stages that I missed when I was in uh, uh, eighth grade now. <laughs> 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 Thank you, not that I could do it. But um, in, uh, you were so meticulous as well with all of these amazing patterns and these templates that you took from the original. So yeah, from the drawings, I was able to put together some templates and uh, I use those templates to keep me on track as far as getting the shape just right. Uh, and uh, so this is a template that goes front to back. I also had uh, 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 horizontal templates that went across. And uh, so I'm using that to check my depth and make sure that I'm, I have the right profile. Uh, and in the background, actually slip back to that last slide. Oh, sure, yeah. Just want to point out, in the background, you can see the calipers that I use to measure the thickness of the plate. It's that aluminum looking thing with all the holes in it. Oh, there we go. Yeah, this, this funky looking thing that I think Jeff invented, yes. Uh, I think you made that, didn't I did, you? I did make that, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, so this is another use of technology, right? So you had your iPod, uh, iPad uh, readily available to yes, consult. Yes, I had all the photos on my iPad from when we uh, we took We weren't loaning him the breastplate to have in his shop. I'm sure you're all surprised <laughs> by that. But. So, uh, so one technique is to set up the piece that you're working on and then compare it to a photo, you know, and kind of eyeball back and forth. 
and see what's off and then correct it, you know? And then you do that again and again and again and again until it gets as close to perfect as you can get it. Um, so that's, and there we have actually the finished breastplate next to the uh, real breastplate. And, but this is an inside shot. And you can really see how the inside surfaces match. Mm. You see all the hammer marks, you see those lines for the embossing, and uh, it's really, it's pretty impressive. And there's a little bit of experimental uh, archaeology here too. Uh, Greenwich uh, breastplates are kind of unique uh, from others from the period that there were these extra rivet holes that were here. And we were able to discern what that was. It was for a pair of a forked strap that you're seeing that we recreated here. And what that does is you have the weight of the breastplate on your shoulder through the strap, and it causes the gusset, this part that goes in and out on that sliding rivet right there when you move your arms, the weight of the breastplate uh, causes it uh, to jut back when you move your arms back and the strap uh, forces it forward. So it was actually a quite an interesting technology that was hidden inside of this uh, that I think you recreated perfectly. And uh, it's not entirely fully understood, but this is our conjecture. Um, yep, no, that was, uh, that was another interesting uh, thing, especially with a breastplate uh, that's very heavy like this. And what the, uh, another surprising thing. What does thing, it weigh, uh, Jeff? Uh, I want to say like 12 or 13 pounds. That sounds I guess that was right. something yeah. we should have looked up before it came out here, huh? No, no, no. <laughs> I think it is about 13 pounds. It has been some time since, uh, since the forming of this. Uh, so, but but uh, also a surprising thing was that the back plate was very heavy. A lot of times the back plate on armors is much, th uh, much thinner. Mm -hmm. And the surprising thing is that this back plate is like eighth of an inch steel and is, and is in very And in itself weighty. is almost like eight pounds. Yes, uh, so yeah. That was, yeah. And uh, then we're getting to the, it's getting closer and closer. Um, yes, so, uh, you know, the uh, embossing has been put in, the, the gussets are in, the roping is getting done, uh, the, uh, the hinge hasps, on the sides are, These are the gussets, uh, this is formed. the roping, um, the hinged hasps. Are and these, like, uh, and now we start, we're kind of jumping the gun here because we're starting to sanding, sanding and polishing. You would actually harden and temper mm -hmm. the piece before you would start sanding and polishing. Sometimes I like to do some sanding and polishing ahead of time just so I, I can make sure that the surface is perfectly smooth. And here we see that. So of course, uh, you know, I, I They didn't use, have these tools in yes. period, you know. They had water-driven or donkey-driven And this is, this is the hardening wheels. process. So the, the armor is heated up red hot and uh, it is very carefully grabbed and quenched in oil. And this makes, uh, causes the structure of the metal to be very hard. Then there's another process called tempering, where the armor is put back in a kiln and it's heated to around 600 degrees for about 30 minutes. And this releases those hard hardness stresses in the metal uh, so that it's not so hard that it, it'll be prone to cracking. Uh, I, I would prefer, uh, the cool thing about working with steel is you can harden and temper it so you can get things that are super hard uh, sometimes drill bits and files and things like that need to be like that, but for mm -hmm. armor, that's way too hard. We, we don't want the armor to crack mm -hmm. and then reveal like a really sharp edge when it cracks. Like glass. Or yeah. shatter. Shatter. Uh, so, so it's better to harden and then temper so that it's tough, but it, uh, you know, it's not going to, it'll rather dent than crack. And of course, in the period, uh, they use these techniques, not always, but often. Greenwich seems, uh, by the metallurgy and the testing, to have used these methods. Uh, but, um, you know, they didn't really understand what was going on on a molecular level. They didn't know that by quenching it in, in red hot, they were locking in carbon atoms. No, in there they, and, yeah, they didn't understand uh, the yeah. metallurgy of it. Uh, but they knew it worked somehow. A bit uh, more. Uh, if they did it right. Right, a bit more archaic. Uh, but enough was detected. They detected enough that they would use this process in order to make the metal harder. <laughs> and jumping ahead here, of course, uh, we're not tonight, of course, talking about the decoration of the armor as much, uh, the etching and, and the gilding. Uh, but it did have to come back to you after it was etched and gilt. Um, and you put this uh, incredible finish. And on the original armor that's in the galleries, there's a little dimple on the side of a rivet. 
Uh, it, the armor has been cleaned many times, and so it's lost this blue finish that you're seeing here that Jeff's going to tell you about. But we found it uh, in this tiny little crevice next to this rivet. Uh, you can see that peacock blue color on the surface. So we knew that the whole armor was probably blue. We also know that from the portrait that I showed you earlier of, of the, probably the original owner of the armor. Um, but how do you achieve this blue color that we see actually in front of us? It's a bedazzling so color. The bluing is done with heat. And uh, uh, so there was a couple other decorative processes that were done before, such as the etching and the gilding, and then the breastplate came back to me. One of the things that was interesting uh, to learn, so uh, you know, I've mentioned the embossing that happens on the breastplate where uh, mm -hmm. some areas are raised and the decorative areas are lower, Sunk. uh, sunken borders, mm -hmm. usually around all the edges. And uh, there's, there seems to be a reason for that, a functional reason that is, when you get it back from the gilder, now this is no longer clean steel. It's all, since it's been fire gilded, now it's like blackened and has different colors on it. And in order to get the nice consistent blue, you have to get it back to the steel color. Beautiful polish. So this has to be repolished again in order to do that. And, and so to keep the gilding and, and etching from being hit by the sanding, now you have these higher areas that make it easier to sand and polish. And that was kind of a revelation because there are academics who conjecture that the bluing and the gilding happened in the same process. And I think you and I both agree that that probably was not the case. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, stay tuned, we have to write a paper. Um, but, yeah. um, <laughs> so, so then uh, when we, uh, so I put it, put it in the kiln to blue it, and that's how we get this lovely color. Uh, it was, it's tricky though, because it's painting with heat. And, and you see this in a welding yeah. line, you see like a rainbow of colors from the heat index. Right, and those same colors are the colors mm -hmm. that they used uh, to, to get this uh, wonderful color. Uh, it's such a contrast, it really makes it. So Jeff, uh, yes. to get to the, the bullets of our bullets and steel conversation, when you knew that this breastplate plus the placard together were gonna face a bullet, how did you feel about this? What, what was running through your mind when you knew that Nova, PBS Nova, was gonna to go to this HP White, this armor testing ground, and we were gonna take a matchlock musket and we're gonna fire this thing at point blank range? Well, I, I thought that that would be a really cool test because you know people are always arguing over, you know, is, could the, what could the armor defend against? And you know, my weapon is better than your armor, or my armor <laughs> is better than your weapon. You know, these kinds of things. So, so it's it would be cool to have this kind of a, a, a challenge and see what happens. Were you and worried about your we, months of work? I don't think I was that worried because I'd been working with wow. the breastplate for a long time. And I, was I knew how thick, <laughs> what's that, what was that? I was worried. You were worried, I this know guy. you were worried. Yeah. Uh, but I, um, anyway, uh, you know, I was not there when they, uh, he was when they not, did the musket test. So, uh, were you relieved when you got the phone call? It was. I knew that they were down there, that they were doing this that day. And, you know, I got this phone call and, and it was a success. And uh, everybody well, let's roll was congratulating the, uh, me. Roll the footage from Nova. It was, it was very satisfying. Yeah, I think they've all performed incredibly well. Whoa. One bullet is gone. Armor, one bullet, nothing. At 20,000 frames a second, they can see the musket bolt disintegrate upon impact. Wow. Yeah, see how the curvature deflected it away? Right. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Let's show you the peas cod belly. It's not just fashion, it's function. Thank you. There's barely a dent on the breastplate. You can just tell where it happened, that's it. Well, I mean, there's no question about it. This is something where... So, it worked, thankfully. Yes. Um, yeah. And uh, in the placard, you can lift it up, Jeff, if you want. Uh, yeah. um, uh, you know, there's the dent. You can see, uh, show the inside. Um, so there's the, uh, the impact where the bullet hit. And, you know, it's, that's a pretty good dent there. And you can actually see it on the inside, too. And you can see where it flattens out because then it hit the breastplate. It, and there was only a little mar on the breastplate. Yep, so this 
fits over the top. So, uh, you know, getting back to if I was worried or not, I, I had been working with these plates for maybe about a month or two by the time you, they got to the gun tests. And uh, I knew that they were heavy plates and that they were strong. I also had come to realize just how important this glancing surface was, you know, that if any object mm -hmm. that comes and hits it is gonna, is gonna glance off. So mm -hmm. I wasn't too worried, but you know, hey, there's always the possibility. You never know what could happen. But it was very satisfying to get the phone call that uh, the breast plate survived and that uh, it was a success. Yeah, and so. you can see the smear of lead that's permanently on the surface too from the bullet. The bullets just evaporated, but anyway. <laughs> um, so Jeff, that sort of brings me to the next and final sort of egotistical point. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> what was it like when I came to the, see you to see the finished work and we put it on me in this get up, this, this costume that was made uh, uh, for actual for demonstration purposes in the future. People will be able to handle the costume and the armor, we hope. Um, what was it like after you saw me put this on there? I, I know what I felt. I, was like, I didn't recognize myself, but what did you think? <laughs> Well, it was, uh, it was really amazing uh, because now you have, not only you have the, the breastplate, but you have, you know, that's the thing, I think, when you go to a museum or whatever, you don't see things in context. And uh, sometimes you're just seeing just the plain steel or you're not seeing it in the context of everything else. So to see this on, you know, with the proper doublet and the millstone collar and, uh, you know, those, um, the trunk hose, uh, it, was, it was gorgeous. It was like uh, seeing a painting come to life because you see paintings of nobles in the 16th century and you know, they, they don't have their full armor on but they have you know, the breastplate and the collar and, and they're wearing you know, the rest of their costume there with it. And, and it's, it's really you know, highly fashionable and it's just amazing to but very see, functional. That, see that in life, mm -hmm. right? To see it come to life uh, for real, right? Uh, so, it's very yeah. slimming. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I have to say, I, it, it amazed me too, uh, in a huge way. Uh, and I think this is all to you and the team. Uh, the incredible ability to, really, it's like the, you know, passing the baton. Uh, it is a race. Um, and the race isn't finished yet, is it? No, it's not. No, what do we have not. left, Jeff? We have uh, Four arms, years in the making, still pauldrons, going. Uh, and a uh, burgonet and a falling buff. So That's there's right. Some more parts to make. So stay tuned for in the future, uh, we will uh, be having, hopefully, uh, public displays and people can handle it when it's completed and, uh, and get to see it, I hope. Uh, and, and anyway, uh, thank you so much. We have an opportunity for questions, if you would like. Very much um, looking forward to questions. And we have two microphones, one in this aisle and one in the other. So um, we will get started. Um, I'll start here, and then she's coming down to you there. Thank you so much. That was really uh, fascinating. I had a question that I always see the proofing marks in museums on pieces, and I wonder uh, what that does to the um, to the armor, does it does it weaken the armor to do the proofing, like the way a bicycle helmet, you know, it's great until the first shot, and I wonder, is that a, a, a thing that, that people worry about with, uh, with proofing uh, I, real armor? I would say it depends on the piece. Uh, you know, like, uh, it, it, it depends on the structure of the metal in that area. I mean, sometimes the metal would just be pushed in and that's it, and it's not really gonna do anything. But maybe if there was a crack there or delamination, then it, that might become an area of weakness. So it really, mm -hmm. it depends. I think they were willing to take the chance that they're probably not gonna get hit by a musket ball at exactly that same point. But you know, uh, the, the breastplate that I showed you earlier with the cannonball through it, uh, that had multiple gunshots on it and one of them went through. 
Um, I've also seen a breastplate in the, the Worcester Art Museum that has uh, a, de uh, a proof mark here in a hole a few inches from there. <laughs> and, um, and then you start to actually question, well, maybe this was a racket. Um, <laughs> but no, you don't know. We don't know. Um, and, and to add to that, so I made a, uh, like a conquistador mm -hmm. armor at one point in time, and, and I wanted to make it look like it was bulletproof. <laughs> uh, I did not fire a musket at it, but... I faked a, a mark, a proof mark on it. So I put a dent in it. And actually, the people that uh, hired me to make that one, uh, they actually called me later, why is there a dent uh, there? And I had to explain the whole concept of the proof mark. Yep. So it's called bloomery steel. And is that because of the blue color on it? Or is that, you were saying that they knew in, that if you heated it to a certain temperature, it would turn different colors. And then, um, where did you, did you go to read something? Did you go to any books when you were working on this project that taught you more about the, the mechanisms of the, fa of the production of the original armor? And um, also, I got one more question. That is, uh, where would you recommend someone, someone who's interested in working with bloomery steel go if they wanted to start working with this material? Mm. Those are my questions. Okay. So bloomery comes from like a bloom, like a, fl like a flower, right? So not so much the blue color, but like flowering. So inside this long stack uh, that is smelting the steel, you know, you get a bloom from it, which is this spongy mass. Um, and then, uh, what was the second question? It Where was... could he go to learn more about using bloomery steel? Well, I can tell you Door County Forge Works with Rick Furrer yes. is where we did all this. There, there are places, actually, where you can, there are people that it's are growing. experimenting with the mm -hmm. bloomery process, and they are, uh, um, you know, running bloomeries uh, usually as a fun thing to do with, you know, like a blacksmith getting getting together. Blade smithing. It's, yep. it's, be uh, it's become a, a whole fad to, you know, yeah. sort of create blades from scratch. Yep. Smaller yep. scale. So that's, and uh, in our sort of research, I remember coming across some people that were actually making blooms and then selling them. And they were just doing, they weren't making armor or anything, but they were doing artistic things with them. Because it was just... You know, there's something just really interesting about the, the quality of the steel, the metal. Uh, and then your other question about uh, do you read books to find out how to do this? Uh, uh, I, I did not. In fact, there was, there's not really a whole lot of information on, um, mm -hmm. on how to make armor anywhere there's, when, I, when yeah. I started. Uh, yeah, there's, uh, you know, there's uh, uh, Guy Folks, uh, folks uh, on uh, making armor, yeah, which he yeah. very barely talks about actually making armor in the whole book. It, yeah. Um, <laughs> but, uh, and that was written in the 1920s. But, you know, there's no manual from the period that talks about how to make an armor. No, so when I, I made it, you know, when I decided that I was going to pursue this kind of career or, or making of armor, I read all that I could get. You know, I read stuff about silversmithing and coppersmithing. Uh, I looked into mm -hmm. other metalworking yeah. work, you know, uh, you know, how are things made? How do modern people make things? Blacksmithing, so, uh, and then learning from other people, people that I could find that were doing stuff, making, other people making armor, talk, talking to them. Uh, anywhere that I could. Now there's much more stuff. I think there are a couple of books out there mm -hmm. on making of armor. Maybe one of these days I'll I think you should take write some one, time Jeff. and write one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. We have time for one more. Can you elaborate on the, I believe you said it was roping, the process for uh, making and attaching that? Uh, say again, elaborate on... Roping. The roping, the decorative roping. The roping. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, uh, so you have to create a hem or a roll, and that would, you know, forming the metal over, and then actually in the 16th century, it's back on itself again. So you're, you're creating a, a loop of metal, um, but it's going all the way around the edge of something, right? And... Uh, then, after you have that... Yeah, see, there's, there's a hole here. It's kind of hollow. Yeah. It's hollow on the inside. Uh, and then you come back with a chisel, and the chisel might have a slight curve to it. And it's not a sharp chisel. It's a blunt chisel. And you're just looking to sort of indent the impression into the metal. 
and, and that's what gives you the roping. But then you go back in with a file or a cutting type tool and define it. Now, some of these are more easily defined, like a hem like this has to be round because uh, it's engaging the helmet sometimes on a, what's called a turning collar. Uh, but other types of hems, like in the 16th century, I, th I think the Greenwich is, is pretty uh, low key. You know, these are just filed in. Uh, there are other armors that look like real roping, you know, and, and that's done where there's a special stake that goes inside. As you're forming the, the roll of the material, you're pushing the material down in order to replicate the rope. And that's much harder to do. I think that this, this process, Greenwich armor is much easier in, in, as far as the roping, executing the roping. <laughs> so in artistic terms, it's uh, re repetition, repetitive. Uh, when you start to look closely, it's not as fancy as you might think it is. <laughs> well, thank you, Jeff. Uh, thank oh. you so much. <laughs> I think it's pretty fancy for you. <laughs>